For many centuries, London was a dangerous place. It was a magnet for the very worst kind of people. Jack the Ripper dominated the headlines. But he wasn't the only killer around. Murder was afoot. The fear of death was everywhere. But police had their work cut out to track the culprits down. In this series, we'll be investigating some of the city's most notorious and intriguing crimes. The female defendant. Sexual intrigue. Vicious murder. As well as the latest technology fed the nation's insatiable desire for gruesome stories of London's dark side. In the late Victorian era, Jack the Ripper dominated the headlines. Whoever he was, he terrorized the Whitechapel area of London's East End. Conditions in Whitechapel and East London were, were sort of pretty horrendous in, in, in the heart of what became the Spitalfields area. The tremendous density of population. People lived very closely together in those days. Streets were very crowded, very narrow, very dark. Um, a lot of poverty. Outside London, the population was about 25 persons an acre. In London, outside the East End, about 50 persons an acre. In the East End, in the heart of it, in Spitalfields, it was over 800 persons an acre. So you had this tremendous overcrowding. A lot of people weren't able to survive except barely on the breadline. Also, there are businesses pushing into the area and buildings are being demolished, so housing is getting less and less, and so you have seven, eight, nine persons in a room. It is pretty horrendous. Whitechapel itself was considered to be the very worst slum in London. The author, Jack London, in his first-hand account of the impoverished area, the people of the abyss wrote, nowhere in the streets of London may one escape the sight of abject poverty. While five minutes walk from almost any point will bring one to a slum. But the region my handsome was now penetrating was one unending slum. It was in this foul environment that the Whitechapel murders would begin in 1888. The notorious crimes of Jack the Ripper horrified the city and, indeed, the entire world. But he wasn't the only killer around. Late Victorian London had some of the most unpleasant characters in the capital's history. Could one of these known killers also have been Jack the Ripper? There was the Ogress of Reading, Amelia Dyer, the Lambeth Poisoner, Dr. Cream, and the mysterious George Chapman who carried out a terrible crime on Borough High Street. The area around Borough High Street was notorious in the 19th century. The street had been the only route into London from the south, leading, as it did, straight up to London Bridge. In 1874, a police constable was to make a horrifying discovery outside number 54 Borough High Street when he apprehended Henry Wainwright clutching the dismembered and decomposing body of his young mistress Harriet Lane wrapped in a cloth.
Harriet Lane was to become Navy slang for preserved meat. A great many alehouses and coaching inns lined the road. One of the most infamous was the Crown, whose proprietor in the year 1901 was Mr. George Chapman. That wasn't his original name, though. He was born Severin Antonowicz Klozowski in Poland in 1865. Chapman had originally trained in Poland as a felcher. Felcher is often mistranslated in the Chapman story as surgeon. But Felchers were not surgeons, they were military barbers who'd had some training as medical orderlies. And they were clearly held in low esteem by the Polish military establishment, which is maybe why after years of training, Chapman decided to move to London. You'd be forgiven for being a bit suspicious about Mr. Klozowski, AKA Chapman, when I tell you that his dilapidated pub, the Monument Tavern, was destroyed by fire and he made a substantial insurance claim. It was refused, but that didn't stop him moving on with a new pub and a new wife, Maud Marsh. Right by here? Yeah. We're selling seats upstairs. For 20 shillings, you can wave at the king. You never know, he might just wave back. <laughs> He'd certainly wave at you, from what I've heard. <laughs> I've never listened to those rumours. Louisa, when you're done with that, can you make a start on dinner? Yes, Mrs Chapman. He employed several young women, and in August 1901, a certain Maud Marsh was looking for work. Maud and her mother arrived for an interview with Chapman, and she was immediately employed. Seems strange, though. A king. I know. As far as I'm concerned, a woman should always be in charge. <laughs> I was just telling this gentleman here about the parade. Take the vitals. Of course. Get out. My daughter started working with him that summer. Late August, it would have been. He was pushy with her at first, I felt. They were married very quickly. But she did seem happy. Watch her, all the neighbors cry. George? Louisa? Maud Marsh was not married for long before she fell violently ill. <coughs> Maud started to suffer a lot of vomiting and she spent 12 days in Guy's hospital and actually sort of recovered, then went back home again and then started to suffer again. Maud Marsh had been struck down by mystery illness. Her mother and her doctor would be unable to determine the cause. One man knew, however, George Chapman. He would have complete control over the dreadful scenario that played out above the Crown Pub. But just how long would his crime remain undetected? 
Maud Marsh, a young woman of 19, had not long been in the employ of George Chapman, the proprietor of the Crown Pub on Borough High Street. They soon became husband and wife, and not long after, Maud was taken ill. Chapman was the only person to know the cause of her sickness. Murderers like George Chapman were tricky to catch because poison was hard to detect at this time. In fact, so much so that arsenic had earned the nickname inheritance powder, such was the problem. But the poison that George Chapman was using was something different, tartar emetic, which contained the equally deadly element antimony. Four years before Maud was taken mysteriously ill, Chapman had bought an ounce of tartarometic from a chemist in Hastings. Tartarometic was used for cough mixtures. It caused irritation of the throat, but it also caused vomiting. Antimony was a metal which was part of the mixture. Too much would cause the victim's death. An ounce is about 450 grains. 12 grains would be enough for a fatal dose. Poison was very easy. You know, one could go to, the, to a shop, buy a poison, you say you wanted it for the rats. Poison was used in all sorts of wallpaper, fly paper. So poison was very, very easily available. An ounce would be enough to kill more than 40 people. It was certainly enough to kill Mary Spink and Bessie Taylor. They were Chapman's previous wives, both of whom died from a mysterious illness just a couple of years after meeting him. Chapman had actually brought in a doctor to treat Bessie Taylor when she fell ill, but the doctor was unable to discover that the real cause of her illness was Chapman himself. In fact, the doctor was convinced that Chapman was in a genuine state of grief. When Maud Marsh fell ill, the same Dr. Stoker would be brought in. Before in the summer, it was the same. She was in hospital. Doctors there have no clue. They say me, is this, is this. But she did recover? Yes. Well then, you have my instructions. You come tomorrow? Yes, of course. Do not concern yourself too much, Mr. Chapman. She is young, and she is strong, and she has you to look after her. I'm not worried. I can see him now, broken with distress, urging me to spare no trouble, no expense. I was there most days. I had no conception of what he was really doing. What? You haven't finished your water. She's doing much better already. Is that champagne? It's for stomach. George, come on, don't waste the champagne. I waste his customers drinking it. When you're like this, no, no. Are you needing more water? We will fetch. Drink. you about him. You'll be right as rain. 
I know it. George Chapman had a very clear and despicable modus operandi. He seemingly enjoyed watching the suffering of a slow death by poisoning. A local chap walked into the Crown pub when he was a boy and was served a glass of water by the owner. That boy was to become the world famous Charlie Chaplin and he wrote about the incident in his autobiography in 1964. As a boy, I stopped at a saloon in London Bridge Road and asked for a glass of water. A bluff, amiable gentleman with a dark moustache served me. For some reason, I could not drink the water. I pretended to, but as soon as the man turned to talk to a customer, I put the glass down and left. Two weeks later, George Chapman, proprietor of the Crown Public House in the London Bridge Road, was charged with murdering five wives by poisoning them with strychnine. His latest victim was dying in a room above the saloon the day he gave me the glass of water. Well, Charlie Chaplin clearly got a, a few details wrong there, but what he was right about is that while he was standing in that pub, Maud Marsh was dying in the room above his head. <laughs> she couldn't keep anything down. I had all her favourites made roast pork and potatoes and... I was supposed to make everything right for your child. For many years, George Chapman seemed untouchable. His devious work as a poisoner had gone undetected. Now, another victim, Maud Marsh, was bedridden and close to death. How much more harm and misery would he inflict before he would be eventually brought to justice? In the Down at Heel area of Borough High Street during the reign of Jack the Ripper, a poisoner was also at work. George Chapman had already killed two wives and was now working towards the murder of another, Maud Marsh. Thankfully, it would only be a matter of time before suspicions finally started to form around him. Mrs. Marsh? You did this? What? Maud said you liked photography. Yes, I make photographs here. I mix chemicals. Keep it. It's the not even knowing, George. Can't we get a second opinion? Dr. Stoker, he is a very good man. Yes. And I think 
If one doctor cannot help, even 50 will not. George, we have to try. Chapman couldn't evade suspicion for much longer. Maud's mother, although still unaware of what he was doing, was growing more and more wary. But the fact that his hobby was photography seemed to allay her misgivings. This new technology would also be used by the Metropolitan Police at the time. Chapman was a, an amateur photographer, which would have been quite unusual for those days. The police had started using um, photography. They used sort of professional photographers for things like identifying bodies that had been found. It did start to become more and more used by the police, particularly on scenes of crime and particularly in sort of identifying criminals. They photographed some of the victims in the Whitechapel murders, so we're talking about 1889, that sort of period. It was an especially dangerous time for prostitutes in London. Jack the Ripper is believed by most experts to have murdered five women in his killing spree. But others were at work too. One of the worst being Dr. Thomas Neil Cream. He was the cross-eyed, silk-hatted poisoner in South London. He was living in the Lambeth area, and this is where he started giving prostitutes pills containing strychnine. Supposedly to avoid them being pregnant, or perhaps to procure an abortion, but actually the pills themselves were poisoned, and a number of prostitutes actually sort of died on the streets, and they were only 19 or 20 years old. He could never stop talking, giving information away. So when there is obviously a hunt for the Lambeth poisoner, he actually names a victim who the police knew nothing at all about. And when eventually he is arrested, there's all these strychnine bottles found in his lodgings. He was on the gallows, and the hangman said that just immediately before the trapdoor dropped and he was executed, he said, I am Jack the and that was his last words. Another criminal operating at exactly the same time as Jack the Ripper was Amelia Dyer, the Ogress of Reading. She was working in the grim trade of baby farming. Baby farming came about because sort of in the 18th century, London was infamous for the number of babies who were just dumped on the street, put on dunghills and left to rot. If women were left with a baby, they would pay for a woman to look after them. But sometimes these women neglected them, and in two or three cases, there were notorious cases, such as Amelia Dyer. Amelia Dyer, she would advertise nurseries. Then, of course, what she did, she strangled them, wrapped them in a parcel, and dumped them in the river. Eventually, she was caught. Um, she'd been baby farming for about 15 years. Amelia was said to have been the cause of the death of 400 infants. The sort of child's cruelty and neglect was of a completely different dimension to what we've become used to today. The Ogress of Reading, as she was dubbed by the press at the time, even had a song written about her. The old baby farmer, the wretched Miss Dyer, at the old bailey her wages is paid. In times long ago, we'd have made a big fire and roasted so nicely that wicked old jade. But while Amelia Dyer and Dr. Cream were captured and executed, George Chapman's crimes still remained undetected, and Maud Marsh was becoming very ill. Distressed at her daughter's declining health, Mrs. Marsh decided to seek the advice of her own family physician, Dr. Grapple. Mr. Chapman. Dr. Francis Grapple. Yes? I was asked. This is the crown. Doctor. Thank you so much for coming. My daughter's just up here. We've heard, Doctor. No, 50 will not.
Miss Marsh was in a semi-comatose state. Her skin was this dirty jaundice and she writhed with pain whenever I touched her. She was very sick indeed. I was alongside Dr. Grapple throughout his examination. He supported my course of action entirely. There really was no need to involve a second doctor. <coughs> Maud Marsh lay suffering in her bed. The doctors Stoker and Grapple were doing their best to treat her, and in the process, becoming suspicious that foul play might lie behind this sudden illness of a girl whom everyone described as vivacious and full of life. A foreign irritant? From something she ate, perhaps. A poison. Can you recall anything? There was a rabbit. The girl bought it at the New Cut Market. I said... Was it that, do you suppose? Oh, I could throttle her! Perhaps. However, you don't get arsenic in rabbits. Deliberate poisoning did cross my mind. But an accident still seemed more likely. To say otherwise, well, it's tantamount to accusing someone of murder. The two doctors seemed to have been very, very professional. He said they'd been eating rabbit and he suspected uh, tomain poisoning, but then when he went home he thought, no, this is wrong, the symptoms are all wrong, went back. The two doctors then got together and said, it's just as though she's been um, suffering from some irritant poison. Isn't he wonderful? I can see an improvement in her already. He's very young. I think of that. Oh, I'm sure you have things to do. It's fine, Sid. I need to feel useful, George. She'll pull through. I'm sure of it. Now that Dr. Grapple's here. Oh, she was better. What the? I don't understand it. She was better. Yeah. What the? Drink, drink, my darling. Drink, drink. Maud! Maud! Mr. Marsh informed me. I couldn't believe it. I thought he'd called me to tell me she was on the mend. George Chapman had struck again. This would be his last act of terror. He'd put on his grieving widower routine for sure, but he wouldn't get away with it this time. Luck had run out for one of the capital's most wretched individuals. 
Chapman would soon find himself questioned by the police who were starting to piece together his deeply suspicious past. His terrifying life story would be laid bare for all to see at the Old Bailey. Ford Marsh was dead. And George Chapman was putting on his well-worked grieving act. He had successfully faked, breaking down in floods of tears moments after she died. Maud's mother would later describe him as being dreadfully upset. With suspicion around him mounting, the doctors would not release a death certificate. Chapman's grieving routine may have worked on Dr. Stoker before, but this time, it would count for nothing. You come to the funeral? I think she... She would. You have death certificate? I'm afraid there will have to be a post-mortem. I know it's not what anyone wants, but... I cannot sign the certificate without establishing cause of death. Exhaustion. She has been sick. But what caused the sickness? Knowing will help. I do not see the use in it. Maud Marsh's symptoms caused the doctors not to give a certificate for her, for her, for her death, for her burial. The doctor refused to issue a death certificate there was then a post-mortem. The initial autopsy may not have shown anything out of the ordinary, but what happened next was truly bizarre. The mortuary where the post-mortem was taking place was very close to the Crown pub. And as Dr. Stoker and his colleagues were working away, they were interrupted by an unwanted guest. We were discussing the post-mortem results when the mortuary keeper thought he heard something outside. I didn't hear anything, but footsteps he thought in the garden. The public weren't allowed in at that hour, of course, so he went outside to check. As he opened the door, he saw a man disappearing into the gardens, running off. The mortuary is a few hundred yards from the crowd. It was Chapman. He had been listening to us at the door. The unexplained nighttime visit only heightened Dr. Stoker's suspicions. The next morning, he took two jars with the contents of Maud's stomach and samples of her internal organs to the nearby Clinical Research Association. Their tests found an appreciable amount of antimony, and it was determined that this poison was the cause of her death. Stoker contacted the police. She was so proud of this place. It needs a little bit more. The day when the new king, Edward VII, was due to celebrate his coronation, the 25th of October 1902, was approaching fast. The local residents all had that day marked in their calendars for there was to be a royal procession. When Detective Inspector Godley arrived, the pub was doing a roaring trade. Poison. She was in a hospital with same sickness. Well, we'd like you to come to the station while we make inquiries. Today? Now. I know nothing about poison. I come. No handcuffs, it's but, but for business. Just two old friends and going for a walk. Chapman was finally in custody. He was not allowed to attend the funeral of Maud Marsh but he did cover all of the expenses. Maud was buried on the 5th of November, 1902, in what was a very grand affair. Chapman sent an elaborate wreath comprising many flowers, and he signed it rather curiously from a devoted friend. He read all about the funeral in the national newspapers, but was still offering investigators very little help. 
they knew nothing about his life story. And the stories circulating in the press about him were all wrong, but he did nothing to correct them beyond repeatedly pleading his own innocence. While the hearings were continuing in coroners and police courts, investigators were still at work. He didn't do much talking, but he left plenty of evidence for us at the pub. His books were all medical. His accounts included a most helpful record of purchasing tartar emetic in April 1897. And we found two memorial cards he presumably kept as trophies. One for Mrs. Mary Chapman, and another for Mrs. Bessie Chapman. When the police were dealing with this unexplained death, they had the post-mortem, the doctors started to find these traces of poison in her stomach, and they knew that Chapman had had two other wives, and they therefore exhumed the bodies and, and examined them. Now, he was only charged with the one murder, but they actually brought in evidence about the two other women in whose bodies poison was also found, and this all led to the evidence being used to convict him. Chapman's trial began on the 16th of May, 1903. The prosecution was led by Edward Carson. If a distinction can be made in degrees of murder, I submit none is more determined and more malicious than that by poisoning. Certainly, no murder could be more demonstrative of the cruelty of the perpetrator than that of a man standing by the bedside of a person he professed to love, seeing her torture day after day from what he had by his own hand administered. Edward Carson was a very famous lawyer, prominent barrister in, in Britain. He prosecuted Oscar Wilde and secured his conviction. The fact that Chapman had purchased a large quantity of antimony-rich tartar emetic from a chemist several years before was very strong evidence against him. The prosecution had a key witness in the victim's grieving mother. I live at 14 Longfellow Road, Croydon, and I'm the wife of Robert Marsh. And what is your relationship to the deceased? Maud was my daughter. How old was your daughter, Mrs. Marsh? She would have been 20 on February 17th. Can you tell me the nature of her first meeting with the prisoner? She had been a barmaid in a situation at Croydon. In August 1901, she was out of that, so she advertised for a new one. And what was the result of that advertisement? She got an answer, and in consequence, I went with her to meet the prisoner. He called himself Chapman. And what happened? We had a talk about Maud accepting the situation. I asked him if there was anyone else living there in the pub, and he said the top floor was occupied by a family, though I never saw them. He had a ring on his finger and I asked him if he was married or single. And how did he answer that? He said he was a widower. There's always been this public hatred, if you like, of the idea of, of poison because it's uh, such an insidious way of causing death. Um, quite what his mindset was um, I don't know, but, the, but a number of 
uh, women did come and give evidence. The press at the time were fascinated by the story of George Chapman. His exceptionally cruel crimes that were seemingly without obvious motive appalled the public. The jury took just 10 minutes to reach their verdict. Members of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, Your Honour. Do you find the defendant guilty or not guilty of murder? Guilty. Have you anything to say why sentence of death should not be passed upon you according to law? Detective Chief Inspector Aberline, who had investigated a lot of the Whitechapel murders, said to his colleague, George uh, Godley, who was dealing with the Klosowski case, I see you've caught Jack the Ripper at last. This actually led to Chapman being regarded as a, a suspect. There are coincidences, that's for sure. He lived for a while in Whitechapel. He had some medical training. He abused women. And rather strangely, he did live for a while with a woman who shared a name with one of the Ripper's victims, Annie Chapman. But that was five years after poor, dark Annie was killed in the backyard of a house in Hanbury Street. No evidence was ever brought forward to show that he was Jack the Ripper. But my own feeling is there's not enough evidence to bring any charges against Chapman. The once sanguine and confident George Chapman looked numb with terror as the judge donned his black cap with the words, Severin Klosowski, for I decline to call you by the English name you have assumed. The only satisfactory feature of the case we've just completed is that I'm able to address you as a foreigner and not as an Englishman. She loved him. He was a monster. Chapman applied unsuccessfully for a royal pardon and was hanged at Wandsworth Prison on April the 7th, 1903. In his will, Severin Klosowski left items worth, at today's value, 15,000 pounds to the surviving family of Bessie Taylor, but only a ring and some used clothing to the parents of Maud Marsh whose suspicions eventually led him to justice. <laughs> 